According to the World Health Organization, hearing loss is the third most chronic physical condition in the United States, and it's twice as prevalent as diabetes or cancer. Today, 1.5 billion people globally live with hearing loss, and they expect that to increase to 2.5 billion by the year 2030. And that's between the ages of 12 and 35. So this is not from presbycusis, which is that gradual loss of hearing that most of us experience as we grow older, and why we have to talk to grandpa a little louder, but rather from noise-induced hearing loss. Now this type of hearing loss happens with occupational and recreational noise overexposure, and it is permanent, progressive, and preventable. Preventable? Well, why is the World Health Organization predicting a billion more people will have it in less than 10 years? Because if you are not protecting your hearing, you are probably losing it. We live on a loud planet. Our ears are bombarded by noise on a daily basis. We have construction work, lawnmowers, motorcycles. What about the automatic hand dryers in public restrooms? <laughs> They're so loud. And with smartphones and tablets and earbuds, we're actually introducing our children to hazardous levels of noise at an earlier age. We're sending them to their first day of school with hearing loss already in progress. And hearing is a sense that we can't shut off. We can close our eyes, we can close our mouths. It might be easier for some of you than me, but we were not born with an ability to close our ears. We hear all the time, even when we're asleep. So how do we hear? Let's go to that fourth grade science class for a quick review. So the sound waves enter the outer ear through the ear canal and they cause the eardrum to vibrate. That vibration is sent to the three bones in the middle ear, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, or as we were taught, hammer, anvil, and stirrup. And that sends the vibrations to the cochlea, which is that tiny snail-like organ in the inner ear. Now inside the cochlea, there are thousands of tiny hair-like auditory nerve receptors. And they take those vibrations and convert them to electrical energy and send it to the brain so the brain can interpret it as sound and say, that was a dog barking. Now, these tiny hair-like nerve receptors are tuned to specific frequencies. And they're arranged in the cochlea from higher frequencies on entrance and those lower frequencies as we move to the center of it. Noise-induced hearing loss happens at that curve where those nerve receptors for those higher frequencies get destroyed from noise overexposure. Now, this usually happens at 85 decibels or more. But you can actually temporarily damage those receptors and they recover overnight or with breaks in the noise. Have you ever gone to a concert and your ears were bothering you all night? but the next day you were better. Or maybe you get in the car in the morning and when you crank, the radio is so loud it scares you half to death and you have to reach and turn it down. It's possible that during your day at work, you experienced a temporary shift in your hearing. But overnight, those receptors recovered and your hearing was actually repaired. So that next morning, that volume was too loud. The problem is, with noise-induced hearing loss, we don't know when they're going from temporarily damaged and recoverable to, oops, we permanently destroyed it. It could be that very next concert or power lift at the gym or motorcycle ride, and you won't know it. There's no pain. There'll be zero indication that it's happened. But it usually happens when we're exposed to 85 decibels or higher for an extended period of time. Now, a decibel is the unit we use to measure the intensity of sound. Normal conversation, 60 to 70 decibels and considered a safe level of hearing. But once we get to 85 decibels or higher, we are now at a loss, we're at risk of hearing loss. How do I know when it's 85 decibels? A good rule of thumb is if you're standing arm's distance from someone and have to raise your voice to have a normal conversation, then more than likely that background is 85 decibels or higher. 
And decibels are measured on a logarithmic scale. It's not a standard linear scale. So if you go from 85 decibels to an environment that's 88, it's not the same as going up three notches on the volume on the TV remote. You have doubled the intensity of sound in that room. And every increase of three decibels, you double it again. So it looks like a small increase in decibels, but it has an enormous impact on, our, on the way our hearing is received, on that noise on our, he on our ears. And remember, we said those receptors are tuned to specific frequencies. So once you permanently destroy them, you lose the ability to hear those frequencies for the rest of your life. And those frequencies often occur in sounds of nature, like the birds singing or the chirping of crickets. They can even show up in the tone of voice of your wife or the laughter of your grandchild. And you might be thinking, that's OK, Kim. I could care less about the sounds of nature. And I've ignored my wife's tone of voice for years. <laughs> well, shame on you. But here's the catch. <laughs> the thing is, these these higher frequency sounds regularly show up in our common everyday speech patterns. And they are TH, SH, F, S, H, CH, K, T, and P. Now, not understanding those sounds affects our ability to communicate with anybody, regardless of the tone of their voice. Let me give you an example. If I were to say, hey, Chuck, watch out for that pipe. But Chuck has noise-induced hearing loss. You know what he hears? Hey, uh, well, ow, or ay. So he didn't move, so I say it louder. Hey, uh, well, ow, or ay. Chuck just got hit with the pipe. Because with noise-induced hearing loss, saying it louder doesn't help the clarity at all. It's not like presbycusis. So saying it louder doesn't help it. People with noise-induced hearing loss will say, why are you yelling at me? I hear you. I just can't understand you. Or they'll accuse you of mumbling. You're not mumbling. They've lost the ability to hear those speech patterns for the rest of their life. And once you lose something as important as the ability to understand communication, which is not only dangerous, or at least it was for Chuck, it can have devastating impacts on your social life and the quality of your life. Think about it. From then on, you have to communicate face to face because you rely on lip reading and body language to get the message. If there's a group conversation going on, you can't keep up. You can't read everybody's lips. You no longer want to go to social settings or social events, go to the movies or maybe to church or a seminar like this. And you're going, what did they say? What did they say? You start feeling insecure, your self-esteem plummets, and you begin to withdraw from your friends and family. You'd rather be alone than frustrated because you can't understand the conversation going on. And social isolation isn't the only negative effect. It negatively affects our mental health. Research has linked hearing loss to an increase of symptoms such as anxiety, stress, insomnia, higher blood pressure, increased heart rate, and depression. That does not sound fun, right? But I have really good news. This type of hearing loss is preventable, and we prevent it by protecting our hearing. And I'm going to give you a few really easy steps to help you do that. The first one's mind-blowing. Hang on, take notes. Turn it down. <laughs> All right, teach your children the importance of turning it down. Because let them know once we've lost the hearing, you'll never get it back. And check your headphones. A lot of them are, come with built-in safety factors. And you can set a maximum decibel level so you're not allowed to turn it up past the point where it would uh, make hazard to your ears. All right? The next thing that we can do, if you can't turn down your environment, take as many breaks out of that noisy environment into a quiet space as you can. Remember. We want those receptors to recover, all right? You can also put as much space between you and the source of the noise as you can. No, you don't have to stand right in front of a five-foot speaker at a rock concert to really experience it. You can experience it in the back, and I saved you money on your concert tickets. You're welcome. <laughs> 
And the next thing you can do is be aware of your environment. Remember we said the 85 decibel rule? You can also download apps on your smartphone that sound level meters. I recommend the NIOSH and the Decibel X. They're very accurate. If you're in a loud environment, check your phone. If it says it's 85 decibels or more, take appropriate action to protect your hearing. And last but not least, and my favorite, we can protect our hearing with earplugs, a way to close our ears. I know, I know, you're thinking, it's not cool to wear earplugs. <laughs> I'm not wearing earplugs to my favorite band concert, or I'll be made fun of if I wear it to that motorcycle bike rally ride. But you know what's less cool than that? Not understanding conversation for the rest of your life. So let's talk about earplugs. I hope some of you got some when you came in. The important thing, most important thing about earplugs is if you're not wearing them correctly, it could be as if you're not wearing them at all. And I'm convinced almost no one wears them correctly. So everyone here is gonna learn how to wear earplugs correctly. The first type, I've just got a couple of types. There are all sorts available, but I have some foamy, the foamy soft ones look like, kind of like they're squishy. They are disposable, so you use them and you throw them out. The first thing that you do for it is you roll it down. Everybody, I don't see you, up, 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 roll it down. If you don't have one, use your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna roll down that earplug. I know it's tempting to squish it and fold it or twist it, but guess what that does? It puts a crease in that earplug that may not recover in your ear. Every manufacturing package will, sit, will tell you to roll it down. You roll it down for consistency and conformity. The next step, nobody does. Reach around your head and pull this, this pinna, which is the outer part of your ear, you gotta pull it back. Now, in most of our ears, we've got, we've got cartilage that keeps foreign bodies from our ears, right? From entering our earplugs. So we've gotta open the door to that in order to get that earplug into the ear canal. So you pull that ear back, y'all are doing great, and you insert that earplug all the way in. And the next thing you do is you hold it for three or four seconds and let it recover. Now, a visual check, and I'm looking at y'all, if I can see your earplug sticking out and you look like Frankenstein, it's not in far enough. And if you say to me, I can't get it in any further, it's too big for your ear. A female can have a 50% smaller ear canal than a male. And everybody in this room has a unique ear canal. It's even unique from one side of your head to the other. So you have to find the size and the shape that fits yours correctly. The next type that we have is a multiple use. They look like Christmas trees. They'll be in your bag. They usually have three or four little flanges on them. The good thing about this, not only can you wash them with soap and water and reuse them, but you don't have to roll these down, but you, you do still have to reach around and pull the pinna open and open the door to that ear canal. You wanna get it, all three of those flanges, or if there's four, as many of those inside your ear canal as you can, because you're giving it another chance to catch the noise before it destroys your inner ear. Now, on, that, on this type of earplug, you will see the stem sticking out just a little bit, if I look at you face to face. But the best test is called an acoustical test. We're gonna cup our hands. Remember when we were little and we did this? Okay, we're gonna cup our hands. If you're wearing earplugs and you cup your hand over your ear and it's muffled, noise is getting through your earplug and you need, need to reinsert it or find a different size or shape. However, if you cup your hand over your ear and there's no difference with an earplug inserted, congratulations, you're wearing your earplug correctly and you're protecting your hearing. So we're gonna review those steps real quick. When you leave here, you're gonna turn it down. We're gonna make sure we take breaks from a noisy environment. We're gonna make sure that we put as much distance between us and the source of the sound. Be aware of our environment and remember the 85 decibel and the arm length rule. And more importantly, we're gonna start wearing earplugs, everybody do this, and we're gonna wear them correctly. But whatever you do, please start protecting your hearing now before it's too late. Thank you. <laughs>